Welcome to Extreme Makeover NGSS Edition. This is an episode with a phenomenon about fish kills in the Salton Sea, and it's brought to you by Lydia, Maribel, and Lisa, who participated in a summer institute for teachers that I worked on, and I want to thank them for their idea. Welcome to the Salton Sea. If you've never been there before, this is what it looks like in Southern California. In fact, if you look at a map of California, you can see it is California's largest lake, and it shows up on a map. It's more than twice as big as Lake Tahoe, which is the second largest lake. And about 50% of the migrating birds that fly through California use it as a stopover place on their journey. So this is a really big and exciting place. Uh, lots of birds, they eat lots of fish that live in the Salton Sea. But, on an August day in 1999, if you visited the Salton Sea, you would see this. And if you look closely, these crazy looking shapes here are all dead fish. In fact, the Los Angeles Times reported 7.6 million fish died in a single day at the Salton Sea. And the tagline here is that although this is the highest toll recorded, local residents say it's just a part of summer and scientists fear that the sea is closer to death. So we have a phenomenon. We want to explain why did so many fish die in a single day in the Salton Sea. What sort of things could cause a fish die off? And I have my students brainstorm about this. Think about, okay, well maybe um, all of a sudden there was some sort of strange pollution that people put in there. Or maybe uh, it was a really, really hot day, or maybe a really, really cold day, or who knows? I want them to brainstorm as many ideas as they can. Then we want them to start thinking about this in terms of our SEP2, developing and using models, and models of systems, cross-cutting concept number four in the California framework. We want to think about the Salton Sea as a system, so let's think about what are the components of this system. Well, we've got a large body of water, shown with this outline here. There's some fish, and we know just right off the bat, we know that fish eat. So probably there's some sort of fish food that's involved in this system. And of course, water is in there. Um, and so we've got this basic idea, but there's also something else that's important about systems. Systems have components, interactions, boundaries, inputs and outputs, and overall properties and behaviors. So when we start thinking about this as a system, we need to come up with some questions we can ask about systems. For example, we have our overall behavior here. What a behavior are we trying to explain? We're trying to explain our fish kills. What are the parts that are involved? Well, we looked at a little bit about those. How do the parts interact? What can I leave out from this problem are the questions we might ask about the boundaries. And what comes in or goes out of this system? And that's the question I want to focus on right now. When we think about the Salton Sea, there are no major rivers that go into or out of the Salton Sea. So how did it get to be California's largest lake? This is a question that we want to spend some time answering, and since we're in the Living Earth course, uh, we're trying to think about some earth science phenomena, and this has an earth science explanation, so we're going to spend some time looking at that now. The areas to the north and to the south of Salton Sea are called the uh, Coachella Valley and the Imperial Valley, and those areas, if you look at them, they're very dry, but they're very fertile and sunny. There's lots of great soil there. So in 1904, a long time ago, they built a canal to bring irrigation water from the nearby Colorado River. You might have your students read an article or watch a short video about the history of the Salton Sea, and you'll find some of these great things out. Uh, you might see a picture that looks like this. This is that canal that was built in 1904, uh, where there's the Colorado River along the Mexico-Arizona border and the California-Mexico border uh, in here, and it's flowing along, and they decided to put a couple of different canals off of there. Well, the canal started getting silted up. A lot of, lot of uh, soil was getting in there, so they needed a way to sort of uh, flush it out, so they built a second little opening to that canal uh, so they could put more water through it and, and send the sediment on downstream. It was a great idea, but this is where things went a little bit wrong. This is a picture from December of 1906, and you can see the Colorado River going along down here with these arrows pointing, but instead of continuing along in its channel along the Mexico-Arizona border, something happened. 
it broke loose. It broke free from its levy. This is where the extra channel was, where it was, they were going to flush things out. But actually, they lost control of the river, and it's not only flushed out all the sediment, but actually all the water from the entire Colorado River broke free and went off on a new journey. It looked something like this. There was a massive waterfall along the edge of the levee, uh, water pouring out, and it took them months and months and months to fix it. Uh, what they had to do is they had to build a new railroad line across the levee and then drive railroad cars filled with rock and dirt and dump that rock and dirt over there hoping to plug the hole. It took them three weeks of continuous dumping of dirt after months of planning and effort uh, uh, to get this done. They finally brought the Colorado River, Colorado River back under control. But that was the beginning of the Salton Sea's modern life. Here's an aerial view of what that area looks like. You can see the Imperial Valley over here, the U.S.-Mexico border is this yellow line, and the Colorado R River snakes along through here. I've labeled on here elevation above sea level of different points of land. So uh, up in this spot where my mouse is, that's 200 feet above sea level. Over here is 150 feet, so of course the river flows downhill. and by the time you get near the U.S.-Mexico border at this spot, uh, you're at 100 feet elevation, and that wa river water is flowing down towards sea level in the ocean off to the left. When the channel broke, though, it went out over here. And you'll see that there's another place where you can get to sea level, and that's right along the U.S.-Mexico border in, in California here, uh, where it's just about at sea level. And if you keep going further along in the Imperial Valley, uh, you get to the base of the Salton Sea, which is 230 feet below sea level. So the water broke free, kept flowing, and basically started filling up this basin like a little bathtub. And after they repaired the Colorado River, they were left with a huge lake filled with water, and that lake is what we know as the Salton Sea today. When we zoom out, things look like this. The Salton Sea is here, 60 miles away from the ocean, and when the Colorado River was flowing and broke loose at this red line, it took a right turn and went right there to the Salton Sea. Well, why did it do that? Well, it's because that area is, of course, a low spot, like we showed a few moments ago. But we kind of have a question. When we look at this picture here showing elevations uh, above sea level, why is there a low spot that's 60 miles north of the ocean? This particular map here colors the Salton Sea area the same color as the seafloor along the Gulf of California down here. Yet it's way far away from the Gulf of California. What's going on? When we zoom out to look at this area in a little bit different perspective, we're going to start seeing something interesting. Now this particular lesson sequence should probably come in the instructional segment one of the Living Earth course, which means that we're using some earth science phenomenon to really understand things. And in order to understand what's going on in the ecosystem of the salt and sea, we actually need to understand some things about plate tectonics. So let's take a look at this area of the seafloor in a little bit more detail. Here we're looking at a slightly different color scheme showing the very tip of Baja California and over here on the right side of this green is the coast of Mexico, the west coast of Mexico. But in the seafloor you can see some very interesting patterns, some little stripes along here and then an abrupt break, maybe some other stripes and if we follow those along these have the characteristic pattern of a mid-ocean ridge, a plate boundary that we know about. So if we start looking and tracing those things out at this big map, you can start seeing a plate boundary that looks like this. Now I happen to have my students take this map and cut along that plate boundary. And from GPS observations in this area, we know that the main body of Mexico is moving to the southeast, and the Pacific Ocean here is moving to the northwest. And so what you should do then is take those two uh, pieces that you have and slide them so that they follow these arrows and watch what happens. As you do that, here in the middle of the ocean you get space that opens up and magma emerges at the mid-ocean ridges. But up here where the Salton Sea is, that is not in the middle of the ocean, so we can't have a mid-ocean ridge there. 
we have very thick continental crust. It's much thicker than the oceanic crust. And so as it starts to move apart, you don't get a, a mid-ocean ridge with magma emerging. You instead get a low point in that thick continental crust. And that low point is a little hole, basically, that the Salton Sea is now occupying. It's this plate tectonic setting that determines the inputs and outputs to the Salton Sea, which, of course, determines much of the environmental conditions there. When we return to our system model of the Salton Sea and the inputs and outputs, there aren't any rivers flowing in or out, so we have only flowing in runoff from agricultural fields, and going out, we have just evaporation. This unique geologic setting has changed the ecosystem over time, and one of the most important ways, of course, is because as water evaporates, the water goes away, but it leaves the salt behind. And so the Salton Sea, named Salton because, of course, it's very salty, and it keeps getting saltier as that water evaporates. And so you can see this on a graph here from the beginning of the Salton Sea's history, of modern history in the early 1900s. It flowed in with nice fresh water and very low salinity. Over time, it's gone up and up and up. Now, how is that going to affect the ecosystem? What could possibly cause so many fish to die like they did in that sudden event in August 1999? Does it have something to do with these environmental conditions and this unique geologic setting? That's what we're going to try and investigate. Students should be able to come with lots of different questions about this, things, data sets they'd like to see. But one of the ones I'd like for them to hit upon is something like this question, which is, have such fish kills ever happened before? If there's just a once-in-a-lifetime event, it's a lot harder to explain than if we can look at a bunch of different places and see if we can spot a consistent pattern and why these fish kills are happening. So we happen to have data that shows that these are, in fact, very common, uh, at least uh, in the relatively recent past, uh, where this is a plot of fish that died in kill events, in millions of fish. And we've been tracking two different species here, the blue ones and the green ones on this graph, not too important, the differences for us. Um, and look here in 1999, remember there was that time when there were 7.6 million fish that died in a single event? Well, there was a previous one uh, on February 19th, 1999, uh, which was described as having thousands and thousands of fish. They didn't get quite a good number, but that wasn't even the biggest year. The next year, there were more fish, and there were more than 20 million fish that died in 2001. You take a look and see 2002 and 2003 were kind of quiet years, and then we started having more fish kills again in 2004. You might, of course, have the question, uh, why did so few fish die in 2002 and 2003? Uh, well, we can explain that partly because the number of fish just tanked here. In 2001, so many fish died in those fish kill events, in those day-long events where you know they were covered in fish along the surface, that basically there weren't that many fish left to die. Uh, I think that explains our 2002 and 2003 data. We start getting more fish uh, growing around in that ocean or in that sea so that they can start dying off in fish kill events in 2004 when our data set ends here. So these things happen a lot and we need to figure out why they're happening. Since we gave our students a little bit of a clue about the Salton Sea's history and the salt in it and showed them this graph, hopefully they're going to be asking a question, of, did the salt have something to do with it? Did it get too salty for them? Of course, this graph gives them clues about that. It tells us that the optimum salinity for the fish called tilapia uh, is, is, is at this line here, around 15 uh, grams per liter. Uh, but ocean water is, is 35 or so, and the Salton Sea is even more than that. So it stands to reason that maybe these fish were dying off because it got too salty. So we have our students read a two-page article about what salinity is, uh, uh, osmosis and the effects uh, that it has on, on living cells, and fish adaptations to salt water. So they read that, and once they have that under their belt, we ask them this question here to get started in their data analysis, which is, we'd like you to think about what will happen to the fish population over time. I'm going to show a graph in a moment showing the a number of fish per acre of land. So basically, if you went out there, marked off an acre of land, and put down a net and caught every single fish in there and then put that uh, all those fish on a scale, how many kilograms of fish would you have in that little area? Uh, and we're going to try and see what that looks like. So I'd like you to predict, knowing this graph here, what do you expect the fish population to do over time? And 
this is a really important process for our students to, if we have a model in our heads, we should be able to make a prediction from that model uh, about what the population does. This is where I might bring in my data analysis tips uh, handout, where I talk about some things that you need to know about when you're looking at data like these, especially a time series. Uh, you need to, of course, start thinking about the axes and what the axes mean. Uh, and I did give you a description of that in words a few moments ago, so that's the first step, and we've probably already done that. But I like to label from the past to the present, and then to the y-axis from as few fish to the most fish. And so we've got that in our heads now. And the next thing we want to be thinking about is, what can data do? Data can have, if you have a line, it could have a trend to it. It could be an increasing trend, a decreasing trend. It could be growing. It could be slowing down. Um, it could be a constant value. These are the types of things that could happen. So they should be looking at their data set and seeing if they notice any trends in the salinity that they should match with trends in the population. There can be patterns. These are consistent things that happen, ups and downs, uh, and they can either uh, occur sort of in a regular way, they can be random, they can have a changing amplitude where they get consistently smaller or consistently larger, or they can change their repeat period, uh, or there could be no rep repetition at all. So they have to look at their data set and try and see any uh, patterns in the salinity. If there are, they should reproduce those with patterns in the fish population. And lastly, one of the interesting things to note in a time series is what I call events. These are sudden changes in a graph. These can be either a big jump, a place where the pattern changes, or the slope changes, or we see a sudden outlier. So do they notice any events in their data set, or are there none? Well, let's look at that graph, and let's do the big reveal and show them what things look like. Here in this red area is a, a period where the salinity is going up dramatically. And we notice that the fish population is going down. They might have predicted something like that. But over here, we've got another really big, quick increase in salinity. And to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't looked into why that jumped up so much so quickly. Uh, but we don't necessarily see a big drop in the fish population. It does go down, but not necessarily changing the trend from before or after. Over here, we see a big drop in the fish population data but that doesn't really correspond to a very large increase in salinity. And likewise, over here, this is the fish kill that we saw in the 1990s, in the late 1990s, and that doesn't seem to have such a, a big uh, salinity change at all. In fact, we can actually uh, zoom in on that here and see here are the August 1999 uh, fish kill, and you can see the salinity in the lake at the time, and it is not necessarily preceded by a sudden increase in uh, salinity. So we have this single day when all these fish died is not corresponding to a single day where the salinity went up. There are certain things that happen in this graph that we can't explain just by looking at these two data sets, but history can tell us, so it's useful to find that out. And the people that made this graph originally mentioned that, uh, of course, originally uh, there were freshwater fish in this lake, but as those started to die off uh, and they wanted to add recreational uh, fish in there, they wanted people to go be able to go fishing and have fun, so they started putting in other fish. They started putting in fish that belonged originally in the ocean in there because the, the salinity was similar to the ocean water. And they, that started in the 50s. Uh, the specific fish, the tilapia, was introduced in the 1960s. Uh, and shortly after there, you can see big boosts in the tilapia population that they attribute to storms, which somehow stimulated tilapia production. I'm not sure exactly how that works. It really helps to look at the history of the situation when you're looking at events that happened, of course, in the past. Another interesting observation from history is that the Salton Sea is subject to algae blooms. This is a picture from a satellite view of the lake, and you can see this green stuff. That's all algae. Could an overactive algae bloom be to blame for our fish kills? We can look at pictures from space over the course of several weeks and see the development of these algae blooms. In May, you can see there's not so much algae. By June 1st, just a few days later, the place is covered in algae and it's green. And by about 10 days later than that, you can see that we're starting to change the color. That algae seems to be dying off. And by June 17th, the algae is, is, seems to all be gone again. So within the matter of less than a month, we've seen a big growth in algae and then a, a sudden drop. 
So that's starting to get the time scales a little bit better. This is matching our time scale of the fish kills a little bit closer. Now we're not looking at things happening over seasons or years. We're looking at things that are happening over days and weeks. So we have our students read a two-page article about algae blooms and eutrophication. Why are those algae blooms happening? How is it related to uh, over-fertilization in those farm fields that are right adjacent? Uh, and does that happen in urban areas near them? So they have this model here uh, of the different stages of an algae bloom from extra nutrients that get added, the algae booms, uh, eventually the algae uses up all of its nutrients and it can die, uh, it has a bust phase, that dead algae then decays, and in the process of decaying, uh, the bacteria that break it down often release toxic chemicals like hydrogen sulfides uh, and also consume oxygen, those bacteria do, in order to break down things. Just like before, they should be able to use this model to predict certain values in a graph. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to make little bar graphs showing how different quantities change from one stage of this cycle to the next. Uh, and so, for example, the amount of algae, obviously, the highest level of algae, the highest bar on here is going to be during the algae bloom. But let's show how this works for nutrients. Let me give you an example. Maybe a student thinks that the number of nutrients go consistently upwards during an algae bloom. Or consistently downwards. Or maybe there's some other sort of a pattern that they're using. This is our way to test out whether our students understand this process and whether they're going to be able to predict what the data actually look like. And we'll do that for the amount of algae, the nutrients, and the level of dissolved oxygen at each of those stages. Then, of course, we're going to do the big reveal and we're going to show them an actual data set. Unfortunately, our data set is not quite as comprehensive as they had for their predictions. Uh, they recognized that these fish kills were important, but they didn't know about them all along, and so they weren't monitoring every single step of the way. So we only have data points from early in 1999 on January 22nd, and shortly after the fish kill on August 24th. So the fish kill happened on August 4th, uh, so a couple weeks after that. We have data about fertilizer chemicals, nitrates and phosphorus, and the dissolved oxygen. So we look at this and we see a drop in the dissolved oxygen. So is this evidence of a big algae bloom at the time of our, of our fish kill? Make an argument for us looking at these data. Or perhaps we can give them a little bit more data to make that argument. Here's a graph showing phytoplankton over three years going up and down. That's our algae. And you can see that prior to our fish kill here in August 1999, there was a big boom in algae that seems to be dropping off and the dissolved oxygen seems to go down to zero. Now that works pretty well, but there was also a fish kill event in February. And if we look at this, that is not associated with a big spike in phytoplankton. Uh, instead, there seems to be some other drop here in the dissolved oxygen that doesn't necessarily correspond. It comes before the big die-off in in the, uh, in the phytoplankton. That doesn't match our model. In fact, there are a whole bunch of times that happen here where there's really low dissolved oxygen, and some of them correspond with die-offs in phytoplankton, and some of them don't necessarily. There's some big phytoplankton drop-offs that don't have really, really low oxygen levels. Why does the oxygen level go up in between these two events here, even though the phytoplankton level seems to be going down and down. Again, we're going to be looking at our data analysis tips, looking here at when are things occurring. Is the timing of the event uh, for the fish kill matching up with the timing of the event for the algae bloom? I'm afraid when it comes down to it, we just aren't seeing a perfect match here, and we have a lot of other... There might, when we really look carefully at the data, we see that our model doesn't do a perfect job of explaining all the ups and downs. So there's got to be something else going on here. We're definitely seeing a general idea that might work out, but some of the details need, still need to be refined. And so we maybe need to learn a little bit more. One of the things that's really important is to understand something else about lakes. Now, lakes can be like swimming pools. Sometime maybe you've gotten into a swimming pool and it was really warm near the surface, but cold down below. Or another time you went in and maybe it was, oh, it was so beautiful, it was perfect temperature all the way through. And the same thing can happen with lakes. They can be layered with hot and cold layers, or they can be well mixed. So let's take a look at this situation of the 
layered lake. Let's say you got a fish in there and eventually of course it dies and as it dies it sinks down and its dead body is going to decay and little bacteria are going to break it down into little pieces and we end up with a layer of dead organic material. Uh, there's low oxygen and the toxic uh, hydrogen sulfide. We talked about this being a classic uh, event in eutrophication. So when you have a layered lake, you end up with a layer of that stuff happening. When the lake is well mixed, you get those, uh, those effects of uh, low oxygen kind of being distributed a little bit more and not quite as severe. We have temperature data from the salt and sea at the time of our fish kill, and we're going to look at that. So this is a little bit of a complicated graph. It shows the temperature uh, from the different depths from 0 to about 12 meters, that's 0 to about 40 feet, uh, during the year 1999 with the temperatures, uh, light colored temperatures are cool, and then as you get to the darker shades of gray, that's a warmer temperature. Uh, but this is a little bit complicated, so I've sort of sliced out little pieces of it so that we can look at it in a more convenient way. Kind of like the pictures that I showed of the layering and the, uh, and the, the well-mixed uh, lakes. So here we are at the surface down to 12 meters, and here we are in March. You can see that the shades of gray are all pretty similar. I call that well-mixed, and it's cool. You can see that the top of the lake is starting to get darker and the bottom of the lake is also getting a little bit darker here, we're starting to see some layering in June. By the time you get to August, it's really dark at the surface and much lighter at the down below. This is lots of layering. This is the time of our fish kill. And by the time you get to September, it becomes well mixed and warm. You can see that the colors of gray are the same at the top and the bottom, but they're much warmer than they were back in March. So again, our fish kills happening in here when the layer, lake is really well layered. So let's think about what could happen there. How does that layering affect the fish kill? Well, layering makes the ecosystem prone to these very sudden fish kills. The fish all live near the surface, near the sailboat up here, uh, but uh, the, the nutrients and low oxygen levels and all that decaying stuff is down, sunken down near, uh, deeper in the lake. Well, let's say a windstorm comes along and kind of blows that top layer somewhere else. That toxic stuff rises up very suddenly, and what happens then is that any fish that happens to be in the near surface is now surrounded by toxic hydrogen sulfide. It's, it's surrounded by water that has very low oxygen content, and that a fish needs oxygen to breathe through its gills, and it's just going to die and other fish are going to die. All the fish are going to die very quickly. So this is a way that we can get lots of fish to die very suddenly, uh, even though it's a, related to a process that happens over days or weeks. I like to call this process the attack of the zombie fish, because it's of course these dead nutrients here, the dead fish, that come back and kill the living fish. Can we see evidence of layering and mixing in this data set here? This is showing the dissolved oxygen measured near the surface on the top graph and measured about 30 feet below the surface on the bottom graph. So in the example at the beginning of 1997 here, you see high oxygen levels in both the near surface and down deep. That tells me they're both high and they're similar, so that means that we have a well-mixed situation. If you look here and the fish kill in early 1999, uh, in February, you see that the surface has a high oxygen level, but down deep the oxygen level is very low. That's evidence for strong layering. So we can see places where there might be layering might be times when we might be prone to a sudden fish kill, and that's exactly the case for our uh, February 1999. You can see that the winter time, right around the turn of the year from December to January, where I've drawn these lines here, usually have high oxygen levels in both the near surface and the, uh, and the deep values. They're similar, so that tells us that maybe there's well mixed at those times and not so likely to have fish kills. The summer times we start getting uh, some really big differences. You can see in June and July of 1998, 
high values of oxygen uh, in near the surface going down to low values at deep, that's evidence of layering likely to have a big fish kill. When you put all these things together, let me show you how I see all of my steps that I might ask my students to try to put together with a little bit of help. So we start off with our farms fertilizing fields. Water runs off into the river, carrying with it some excess fertilizer. That river water enters the Salton Sea, which brings the nutrients. Now the algae grows thanks to those fertilizer nutrients. Uh, zooplankton and fish boom as a result because there's so much algae for them to eat. Now all of a sudden we have so much stuff that's, that's living that it starts to die uh, and uh, more stuff dies because more stuff was alive. That dead stuff sinks down and two things happen. Uh, aerobic bacteria consume oxygen in the water as they break down the dead stuff and anaerobic bacteria release hydrogen sulfide as they break down dead stuff. So we have lots of those things happening there. Uh, that in down deep, that deep water has low dissolved oxygen and high sulfides as a result of those things happening. The wind causes the deep water to burp to the surface, and the fish die basically instantly causing a massive fish kill. So we can trace this directly from what humans have done to this massive millions of fish die off in a single day uh, because of this biological process that's happening. The other thing that we know is that when does algae grow most? Well, algae grows the most uh, in the summertime when there's lots of sunlight available to it and it's warmer temperatures and the chemical reactions can happen faster. And it turns out that the patterns in the Salton Sea uh, of wind cause these wind events to happen more often in the summertime as well. Uh, so we're going to get, we, we need to explain why not only do these fish kills happen, but why do they happen when they happen? They seem to happen more often in the summer, um, although we did see an example in February where that was uh, not the case, but most of them happen in the summertime. Time, and now we can explain that as parts of our model as well. At this point, it's time to test out, did they actually get it? So let's go ahead and give them my claim evidence and reasoning template here and try and see if they can come up with a claim such as the farms fertilizing the field was ultimately responsible for the fish kills. So can they put that together and talk about what they think, what their answer to the question of why did this happen? Can they provide actual observations and measurements that support the claim, what they see, showing us some of the graphs and pointing to those uh, in their evidence, and describing their reasoning that links those two together, the general principles about the way the world works that allow them to link the evidence to the claim, and it's what they know already in their background knowledge that they're about the biological and physical processes. This gives us a really good chance to assess, did they understand all the different links that are going on? This is a very complicated high school process, and for them to be able to put it into a relatively simple claim uh, with the proper evidence to back it up, each one of these little stages, you could actually do a, a claim evidence and reasoning where you have evidence to back up each connection between here. Uh, and so we can go to different levels of complexity for different students or for different classrooms. Uh, but the key here is to assess what they've actually gotten out of things, not just to show them this graph and expect that to be the end or ask them uh, quiz questions on uh, what happens when algae grows, uh, zooplankton and fish boom, or you know, giving them a multiple choice question about what happened. We don't want them to just tell us what happened. We want them to be able to provide evidence for every step along the way. So thanks for coming to Extreme Makeover NGSS Edition on the Salt and Sea Fish Kills. Take a look in the comments and you'll see links to where you can download this presentation and the materials that we've got uh, for it. And uh, tune in next time for our next lesson.